I'm going to talk about our recent developments, and that is uh, the development for a new high-resolution compact gamma camera. Now, we developed this camera uh, specifically for prostate cancer. Uh, so many of the slides that I'm going to show are going to focus on prostate cancer applications. But we see the utility of it to go way beyond uh, prostate cancer and well beyond oncology. And are here today to explore some of the ways that it can be used to understand um, neuroinflammation and pain, the focus of this workshop. We've begun discussions in spinal spinal inflammation studies with Aaron, and we look forward to opportunities to foster new partnerships with uh, you here in the audience. Uh, Terry Lau, standing in the back, president of Hybridine, and I are here together uh, principally uh, for this purpose. Now, the system that we've developed uh, has about a spatial resolution of about one to two millimeter, but we see how to go down to 100 to 200 micron. And so the questions remain and we want to hear from you about what special resolution is needed to be able to help you to further your own research endeavors and to help to facilitate the clinical translation um, of, um, um, of, uh, of your particular effort. So uh, what we've done is, um, is focused again initially on prostate scan cancer. There are a lot of dedicated imaging platforms, molecular imaging systems for breast cancer. Uh, at least a half a dozen of them, but none exists for prostate cancer. One in six men will develop prostate cancer. There's about two million men living in the U.S. that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer today, and probably a comparable number uh, of undiagnosed cases. Um, breast cancer is similar in its frequency for women with about one in seven women that will develop the disease. So we've developed this compact gamma camera uh, to address this need. This is just an example of a few of the imaging systems that exist for breast cancer. All of them, the spec systems work pretty much the same. A radiopharmaceutical uh, that con contains a radioisotope, uh, it's administered to the patients, usually by IV. Uh, it goes to areas and localizes specific cellular uh, activity uh, receptors, and then we can take a picture of that with a gamma camera, and that's what we do in this case. Competition may not be the, the best word, but at least complementary imaging techniques that are frequently used are shown here. One is the traditional SPECT imaging systems that are uh, in existence at every major hospital in the U.S., Western Europe, and Japan. These are large systems, expensive, running about a half a million dollars or more, that have modest spatial resolution, uh, but can uh, provide for whole body imaging. They're dominated by the likes of Siemens and Philips and GE and Toshiba. Um, also PET imaging systems, but PET for the most part has not worked well in case of prostate cancer. And the reason is that the tumors are not glucose dependent, so they're not really sensitive for FDG. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging has very good accuracy for staging. Uh, it needs a endorectal coil, uh, fairly high cost in the magnetic environment, creates some complications for the biopsies, but a useful imaging tool. Now the real workhorse today is ultrasound. And ultrasound is, um, it can be used to determine the size and the anatomy for the prostate gland. Uh, it's portable, it's low cost, it involves non-ionizing radiation. It can be used for image added biopsy, but it has one principal drawback, and that is it cannot easily distinguish between benign and malignant tumors, and there are a lot of cases of benign tumors for men that enlarge prostate condition. So the advantages of the method that I'm going to be describing are, one, that it's very low cost. And this is extremely important because it's low enough that it could be available in the institutions that each of you have versus the more expensive systems that typically must be shared or the people do not have available at all. So low cost, compact, excellent spatial resolution. Tracers uh, target cancerous tissue, ideally having high sensitivity uh, for early detection of disease. Now, my presentation, the outline of it is shown here. It, uh, I'm going to provide a summary, executive summary. Describe what's used today for detecting prostate cancer. What are some of the shortcomings of these tools? Our proposed solution, some of the advantages of that solution, showing you images, both preclinical and clinical images, and then I'll summarize. 
It was hard to put everything on one slide, so this is what I've tried to do. I apologize for being so busy, but the invention is basically shown here, and that is a new way to detect prostate cancer at an early stage with potential application to a wide range of other cancers, to chronic pain, and to drug discovery. We're currently focusing our development in two new areas, enhancing the camera by adding anatomical information. We're dealing with soft tissue, so most of that is done by ultrasound, and bringing together that with image fusion with the molecular images. Modifying the camera with a few applications in mind, small animal imaging and drug for drug discovery, uh, imaging other organs such as thyroid and breast, engineering of a robotic arm to increase the field of view of these particular compact cameras, and redesigning the electronics to improve, further improve the spatial resolution. The time frame is basically for the bimodality system of ultrasound and SPECT is ready in months, certainly within 12 months, and bringing the technology to these other platforms within about 18 months. Now the principal milestones uh, through this roughly three to four year effort are listed here. Partnership created between Hyperdyne Imaging Technologies, Brookhaven, and Johns Hopkins University to develop the technology, the low noise electronics, and to build a prototype. Uh, we've done laboratory testing with a variety of phantoms. We then went to preclinical testing with animal models, following with construction of a cart for clinical trials. Uh, successful clinical test at Johns Hopkins, also at Radiological Associates of Sacramento, using an FDA radio tracer called Processin. Uh, development of new spec prostate cancer agents with better specificity, uh, with very good results there, but I'm not going to talk about that during this presentation. And FDA clearance for the instrument. So what is used today? Uh, right now, uh, it's a transrectal probe. Uh, this is an example of what one looks like with ultrasound. It's inserted into the rectum and it bounces uh, sound waves essentially off of the prostate. Those echoes can be recorded, measured and recorded uh, through video or photographic images and we get a picture of what the prostate looks like and can see density fluctuations. Here's an example of one of the sonograms. This is the prostate shown here and uh, circled in red. This is the rectum, the seretha. Uh, also shown are uh, seeds, uh, in this case radioactive seeds for brachytherapy, trying to do an isodose uh, for uh, basically uh, irradiating unhealthy tissue. This is the area that's suspected of uh, cancer, but could also be a benign tumor as well. It clearly has a pulse echo different than the surrounding tissue. So what are the real shortcomings? of ultrasound is that we can't see the difference between benign and cancerous tumors. Now that has a number of negative consequences. Uh, one is that we need another way to confirm the presence of cancer and that's done by biopsy, that's the gold standard. And a, needles are inserted to remove tissue from the gland. Uh, but because of the very low sampling accuracy, now the instruments take multiple uh, multiple extractions, anywhere from 6, 10, or 12. Uh, it still has a fairly low likelihood of hitting uh, malignant portions, particularly if the cancers are small, making the small cancers difficult uh, to detect, and leading to the general belief that for every case of prostate cancer that's detected, there's at least one case that's missed. And it leads to this medical dilemma when you have positive high PSA uh, but negative biopsy, at what point do you go back for additional biopsy with its added cost and side effects, uh, bleeding, infection, other things, uh, when the urologist still suspects that the patient has cancer? So the solution that we came up with is shown here, and that's the development of the first compact gamma camera that's small enough to be inserted into the rectum to be used as a probe. Coming up close, looking at the gland for a fairly unfettered picture of the, uh, of the uptake of radi radiation of the radio tracer within the gland. It uses CZT detector technology, which is something we can miniaturize uh, and get five to 10 times better spatial resolution than the typical, uh, the typical systems that are used uh, for most clinical applications today, which are based on simulators. Uh, the patient's injected with a radio pharmaceutical, ideally one with high specificity. Um, the uh, processin is the one that's used because it's FDA approved. Uh, and uh, we essentially take a picture uh, of uh, that uptake. 
So what is the role of imaging? Uh, this is maybe more general than prostate cancer, but since this is a lot of discussion on imaging, I wanted to state the principal objectives. A lot of our initial focus is on detection, diagnosis of disease, ideally doing it at an early stage. We also want to be able to guide, and that is to be able to use the images to assist in biopsies. If the correlation is high enough between the pathology and the uptake, perhaps we can eliminate, in some cases, biopsies altogether. We want to be able to localize because now we mostly treat the gland and we'd like to be able to treat the disease. So we'd like to direct treatment not to prostatectomy but to other type of therapies that focus on the disease tissue while leaving the normal healthy tissue intact. We need to be able to characterize because even though one in six men develop the disease, one in 35 will die from the disease. So many of the men with prostate cancer will not die from that disease. How do we characterize the aggressive forms from the non-aggressive forms? Staging for extracapsular, spreading to the lymph nodes or general uh, metastatic activity. And finally, monitoring. How does it respond to hormonal treatments, to chemical treatments, to radiation treatments, uh, and in some cases, just watching the progression of the disease through active surveillance? So those are the principal things we'd like to do in the case of imaging. Here's a picture of the camera. This is the camera that's constructed here. This is a cart uh, that is brought uh, bedside, and this is to assist the physician uh, with looking at those images. So what are the key advantages of this small compact gamma camera that are far more general than the case of prostate cancer alone? One is its compact handheld size. So it's capable of intra-body cavity measurements, getting to positions that are not easy to access, uh, the very much lower cost that I mentioned previously, and also for preoperative and interoperative uses has very high spatial resolution, uh, this giving better image quality, uh, allowing small tumors to be detected and quantified, and assisting in the image interpretation. We can get depth information for better positioning, and we have high sensitivity by being able to work up close to the organ of interest, allowing us to do a faster imaging time, in some cases reducing the concentration of the radio tracer injected in the body. So this is the technology that we use, cadmium zinc telluride. It's a crystal much like the silicon that's used in today's computer chips. Uh, we use these, in this case, for spectroscopy. This is for imaging, where this is pixelated. Uh, I'm going to talk about spec, but we also have developed PET systems as well, where we can use time correlation information to do very similar type of imaging. Uh, but I'm going to only focus on spec in these discussions. This is the comparable systems, the large C-arm facilities that exist in hospitals and many research institutions. And this is what you get, uh, about 12 to 15 millimeter special resolution, much poorer than the one to two millimeter that we obtain uh, with this technology. Uh, this is basically showing the uptake in femoral arteries. Uh, this shows a metas metastasis in the bone. And this is overlaid with CT, in this case, uh, to get anatomical information and to do co-registration. The prostate is down here, and you can see that you get little or no information from these whole body spec systems uh, from, uh, associated with prostate. So we're basically taking our CZT crystals, we pixelate them. Uh, this works much like your digital cameras. Uh, we can go from resolution of 10 millimeter or so down to one to two millimeter. So we can see the fingers and boundaries of the tumoral mass. What we really get from each pixel is counts versus channel number. Uh, this allows us to see uh, for each different gamma ray that is absorbed, we can see uh, the 140 keV from TEC 99M. We can see 171 and 245 from Indium 111. But the important point that I want to make is we can do multiple isotope imaging. So we can simultaneously at this point look at things like disease and inflammation. We can look at lymph nodes and vessels. We can do them all simultaneously using more than two, two drugs if needed because we can isolate each of these different spectral windows and focus only on those images and do it all simultaneously. Okay, just one slide about how that's different from the conventional technology. Uh, and and um, this is basically what the scintillators, uh, the, the workhorse today. Gamma rays come in, they create, they excite a scintillator. It emits light in all directions. Uh, that light spreads and is measured by a photodiode or other type of photo, photomultiplier or other type of photosensitive um, detector. 
It, the light spreading gives poor spatial resolution. The poor energy transfer from gamma to light gives poor signal. And so that's what causes the limitations in today's spec systems. With this particular technology, we have very efficient transfer of gamma energy to electron hole pairs, and because we pixelate them, we channel that charge along the electric field lines and get very high spatial information. So that's what's different between these technologies. We pixelate the devices. These are examples of two pixelated detectors. We typically do about two millimeter, but we can use photolithographic techniques to get down to tens of microns if needed. And it is this pixel size that is the inherent ultimate resolution limitation on spatial resolution. And that's what allows us to get to much smaller, uh, spatial, much better spatial resolution if desired. We develop the integrated circuits at Brookhaven. We integrate and hybridize them all, put them into modules such as the one that you see here that go into the probe uh, that you saw earlier. So these are the components. Uh, these are the detectors. Uh, this is a collimator, a parallel hole collimator that sits on top that guides the field of view for the system. Uh, this is one with them all sealed together with the printed circuit boards uh, that are part of the system that all go into the probe sheath. And again, this is what that looks like. We have limited field of view, so we, in some cases, rotate to get different pictures, and we fuse those different pictures together. Now, these are the example of just phantom studies. Uh, this is with uh, cesium, uh, this is with cobalt 57. We have a very small check source of about 0.5 uh, millimeter diameter, and we just take that check source and we move it to different locations over the imaging head, and you very clearly see how it gets positional information with respect to the location of that particular small 0.5 microcurie source. So we know we can construct an image, and this is just an example of the early um, uh, phantom data. Next, I'll give you some example of some of the animal uh, tests. Uh, this particular one was used with a drug called Trofex. It's iodine-123, emits 159 kV. But we have linearity with these systems from a few tens of kV up to hundreds of kV, so we can look at all of the medical isotopes with this particular camera. It's injected into a mouse. This particular mouse has a xenograft tumor, and we image that. This is what it looks like with the probe. Uh, it may not be easy to see, but this is the tumor that exists right here in the mouse. If you look at a picture, uh, you can see the tumor. A lot of the uptake is in the kidneys. You can see the liver. And in different orientations, we see each kidney. Uh, this particular kidney, kidney two, does not function as well because the tumor is located nearby. But we can demonstrate the roughly one to two millimeter spatial resolution quite easily. This is moving to another example for thyroid, uh, looking in this case with an awake cat. Uh, this is the probe. Uh, this particular cat has been loaded with technetium 99M, and it goes to the area in this case uh, for certain um, endocrine related activity, and we can image that. And we see the distinct lobes associated with the cat. We see the enlarged lobe, the disease that exists in, uh, in, the, in the left side. And we, we can. We can compare that. Uh, this is 25 minute. Uh, we can compare that with. Um, we can compare that with uh, what would happen with the planar scintigraphy. And here you can see the thyroid for the uh, for the planar image system. And uh, you see both the strength of proxy scan image being able to separately image the lobes compared to what we get here. But at the same time, you see the limited field of view. So we can't do a whole body image. Uh, and that's one of the drawbacks, is we're dealing with small regions of interest uh, without doing some type of stepping and scanning. So these are the two comparisons, in this case for thyroid. Let me move to clinical study. Uh, we have, uh, these were performed primarily at Johns Hopkins University, Drs. Choi, Pomper, and Chu, also at Radiological Associates of Sacramento with Ben Franz. Iodine 111 is used, which is the radio tracer and processant. Uh, in this particular case, we do a pre-imaging with ultrasound to determine the location of the gland and its size for how we need to insert the probe. We insert the probe, I'll show you data, at two different depths, a first insertion right near the gland, and as we insert deeper to get a, a, uh, a more complete picture of the gland. And for the first part of the insertion, you see the uptake that's shown here in these raw images. And uh, you can see a much higher uptake. Uh, this particular patient was later confirmed to have prostate cancer. And as we insert about eight millimeters deeper, we see more of that particular cancerous tumor coming into view. 
uh, the, with the, the typical planar scintigraphy systems that are, exist today, uh, we, we uh, have a hard time really resolving what's happening in the gland. You see that uh, both in uh, the spec CT that exists here, showing the prostate, and this is fused with CT in this image. Let's see, showing uh, the clinical studies are uh, roughly for 10 to 12 patients. Those are going to be released at a medical imaging conference uh, details in Spain in two weeks. Uh, this is what, an example of what a prostate cancer, what it, the, um, uh, what it looks like in the case of uh, the human patient, uh, the prostate gland, with regions, in this case, of high uptake and the distribution of the particular drug, prostacin. This is just another example of thyroid uh, in the animal test. So we have uh, FDA clearance uh, for this particular tool for imaging the distribution in the human body, for its intraoperative use to study pathological samples, and also for endocavity applications if a protective sheath is used. It's the first ever of its kind as an intra intrabody cavity probe with FDA clearance. We see a fairly straightforward pathway uh, through the 510K to look at other diagnostic imaging platforms that would utilize this technology. Uh, this is the uh, almost the last slide. Uh, in terms of next steps, we're completing more clinical measurements at Johns Hopkins, Radiological Associates, National Cancer Institute, and others, where we're focused on images of uh, the uptake of processing and some of the new tracers uh, that are under development, and comparing with traditional spec gamma camera. Uh, we're looking at different type of uh, cancers, uh, not just prostate, but thyroid, breast, colorectal, cervical, and other, and also for diagnosing, diagnosing and treating other disorders. Um, we are looking at other medical applications, such as understanding specific cellular activity or behavior uh, for investigating neuropathic pain and inflammation, increasing the, the spatial resolution further. We're improving the electronics, the application-specific integrated circuits for more channels, lowering power, and reducing the footprint for things like the intrabody cavity measurements and upgrading packaging and software. If you look at what we've done, we've taken the, uh, the CZT, we've pixelated them, we've integrated them with their electronics, their low noise readout circuits. We can put these pixels into any particular size that we want to control the field of view for the imaging system. We can expand these from, um, and to put them into modules, which we can build these modules. We can orient them uh, together as mosaic or put them in such ways as we can do Compton imaging to eliminate the collimation altogether. We also work to distribute them in the environment. We've connected them to RF and cell phones. This is different application and security, but we're able to basically monitor radiation uh, throughout the world. And uh, that's something that is also under uh, commercialization and was the principal source for the development of the X and gamma detectors. Now, this is the last slide. Uh, the key demonstrated advantages uh, are that we, we have molecular images targeting intraprostatic tumors for early detection of disease. It's a transrectal probe, very low cost, compact digital, FDA cleared, and addresses many of the shortcomings of the existing systems. It's received a number of awards, which I won't go into. There's a huge potential impact with roughly 1.5 million prostate biopsies in the U.S. alone every single year. And we're seeking these other uh, medical uses, uh, such as um, studying the spinal neuroinflammation, uh, understanding activated uh, microglia, among others. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Lunch is ready afterwards, and we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock. Um, so I'd like to open this up for any questions. Yeah. Hi, this is very nice talk, very nice technology. Um, well, you described pr prostacint. I think most of the people here probably don't know, but it's it's a typical example of, of what kind of probes the FDA is, is approving because I, I'm an, an antibody, um, okay. uh, somebody that makes probes with, with antibodies and prostacin, it's, it's, it's an antibody that targets the intracellular domain of a receptor. It's completely illogical. It works clearly. There's many, many clinical studies that show that, I mean, that it works, that it can detect gas, but nobody really knows why and, and what's detecting. So you, um, you, you 
kind of alluded on the fact that that you're also interested in, in new kind of probes and, and new targets. Can you say something about that? Yes. Uh, Trofix is an example of one. First, just a comment. Uh, you're exactly right. Processing has a number of limitations. We, um, at one point, I think they weren't even so well understood because you couldn't image the distribution. Now that we can image the distribution in the gland, we see there's a lot of uptake uh, in blood pools, in normal tissue. The specificity may be two to one, which means we have we need tremendous demands on the contrast for our system. Now, we have very good contrast, but still, it cr we see the limitations, uh, and so we want better drugs. There are several under development, but someone, perhaps you, was speaking earlier uh, in with uh, uh, Dr. Nuremberg about the long time delay uh, in getting SPECT agents approved. Uh, so it's a long pathway. Uh, Trofix, the one that I showed with the xenograph in the mice, uh, that is an example of one that has a specificity that's much, much better than processing, 50 to 100 to 1, allowing much better images uh, for the uptake than we can get with processing. So we're eager and to see these drugs. The SMA targeting? Yes. Yes. Uh, in, um, um, so so we're, we're looking forward to the approval uh, for some of these additional drugs, which is certainly what makes our job much easier. And some of that effort is supported through this own collaboration. Most of that is done not by me, but by a Johns Hopkins University, largely led by a guy named Martin Pomper, is the principal purpose, person that does that. Any other how much cross-talk do you have uh, from pixel to pixel? That's probably the question is how much cross-talk you might get from pixel to pixel because that's probably what limits the size of the pixel itself since those high-energy electrons will go uh, yeah. past it's your pixel for sure. That's a good point. Clearly, you understand how this works. The, uh, there isn't much crosstalk at 2 millimeter, but as we go down to a factor of 10, then there will be some crosstalk. So there's essentially what we also call charge sharing uh, between pixels, and we have to be able to do the summing to be able to get that charge sharing correct, and we do that. Our software is set up to do that now. Also, it incorporates something called my maximum likelihood estimation to be able to use that information to potentially even get to sub-pixel resolution.